So we've now arrived at the Bushcraft Show and me and Bex are setting up our tents. Hi Bex. Hi. So it's great to be back here at the brush, 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 at the bushcraft <laughs> show with my sister, and we've just got the fire going, and uh, the chicken is going on soon because we are starving, chicken. aren't we? Yeah. So hungry. Very hungry. Yeah. So looking forward to this great weekend ahead. So this is Mum and Dad set up. They're in the hammocks. Pretty nice. I'll come down and have a look. It's been a really good chilled first day at the Bushcraft show. I'm super hyped for tomorrow. I'm doing a uh, gong bath um, meditation in the morning. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see what that's about, see how that turns out. Now I'm just chilling around the fire with Bex. I'm gonna have a hot chocolate. So it's day two now, and we're now heading down to the show. And I've got my gong bath session coming up soon. And then we're gonna do some talks today we're gonna cut a squirrel and we're gonna cut make a squirrel. <laughs> Morning guys. I'm going to move out move you out your head into your heart. And this is gonna be a bit tricky because you've got the rest of the world outside. And you, it's very difficult to stay in the moment. And I'm gonna ask you to try and focus inward while the rest of the world outside is, is carrying on. Because you're not part of the world really. The only world that matters is the one that's inside you. And if that's out of balance and not functioning at its perfect resonance, like we said, you get ill. So you get things like backache and toothache and you get rashes and allergies. You get fibromyalgia and then also major serious things go beyond that if you don't start to listen to your body. So in this experience, we're going to try and quieten your mind slightly and get you to relax. Your brain is going to panic. Your thinking mind is going to go, oh God, this is weird. So it will try very hard to keep you out of this experience. And all you do is you just focus on your breath, visualize it traveling it down through your body, which I will guide you. If it gets a little bit uncomfortable, you just sort of say, allow, I'm allowing this. You're fully aware of where you are. You are perfectly safe. And when gongs enter a space, they make it sacred. And you will feel very much loved and comfortable, hopefully, if you allow it. Feel your breath travelling through your vessel out to the soles of your feet. Oh, right.
So it's day three at the bushcraft show and really enjoying it. It's gone so fast and just watching some talks now. It took me 17 years to do these mountains, more of that later. It felt like it took me 27 to write this book. So anyway, I went to the Alps, became a mountain guide, so I can legally guide in the Alps and things, climbed the North Face, the Ida, Mont Blanc, but then I wanted to go and do these bigger mountains in the Himalaya. But this one is one of the most dangerous, Annapurna. It was first climbed in 1950 by the French, before Everest in 53. And when I went to climb it in 2002, it had only had 100 ascents, but 60 deaths. I reckon that my skill and stamina experience would negate the risk, and anyway, I did survive it, so I climbed. So that's how dangerous some of these 8,000ers are. But I should say that I don't have a death wish, I have a life wish, and climbing enhances my life. And one of the things that's kept me alive is that I always say no mountain is worth a life. Right, I've had a few close shaves, and again, it was complacency. And lack of attention to detail that made me have this accident. And it was uh, on a trek to one of these 8,000ers, the fifth highest mountain in the world, 10 day trek to base camp. And I let my guard down, so I thought, well, I'm just trekking, it's just walking. Um, and the Fijians are looking at me as if I'm a complete weirdo. Um, and then I grabbed the camera and my camera equipment and stepped out of the boat and walked up the beach. And I'm not, <laughs> I'd love to say I walk the walk as in, in everyday life, but you know. I was living in London at this stage and so my feet were London soft and I was stubbing my toes on the coral reef and I was like feeling completely out of my comfort zone. Initially I was living in a cave. Don't live in a cave. It's drafty for a start. It's cold. There's just some really fundamental practicalities that you don't think of. We're all wearing jackets and clothes at the moment and even if it's not that cold outside, they give us that insulating layer. If you lie down on goat shit, which is essentially what I was doing, in a cave, and there's even the remotest breeze, you start chilling, you start getting really, really cold. Um, obviously, there was no light at night, because I hadn't got a fire going, I hadn't got a head torch, I hadn't got anything like that, and so I was lying like an animal on, essentially, a, a bed of goat shit in this cave. Cold, feeling vulnerable. One thing I thought, do you know what? I need to make a fire, I need to start making progress. And so I put all of my efforts into making a fire. With this, I thought after a couple of weeks, I'll start getting lonely. It had nothing to do with loneliness, really. Um, bizarrely, it had everything to do with my own identity and how I, how I worked out my own identity. And this is a little bit of psycho, psychological um, babble, but you're gonna have to stick through me, sit with me through this because it was actually crucial to how I was sort of behaving on the island. So I had to literally work out from some scratch, what did I stand for? What were my morals? Uh, do I believe in being honest or dishonest? You know, and <laughs> every single little part of who am I? If, if nobody else was here, and nobody else was watching, who is Ed Stafford? And that was um, quite a difficult thing to navigate. I keep thinking like, um, I've just been left here and uh, Nobody cares. I'm really craving company. I'm really, really lonely. The thing that invariably everybody needs in life in order to really thrive is to have other people around them. And so I think the thing that I took from this more than anything else is that, yes, I knew that I could do things on my own and I needed to get to that stage in order to have a, a proper sense of identity that was, that was um, self-generated rather than a reflection from other people. But I very much recognised that the that the way to take this forward in a positive manner was to, to then hold on to myself when I'm amongst the people that I want to have as part of my life, the people that I love. And so for me, the real way to thrive is both to be loved and um, obviously to love those around you. Thank you very much indeed. So me and Bex have had a really good day today at the show, um, learned a lot of things, um, seen a lot of good talks as well, especially with Ed Stafford, I really enjoyed that one. And Becky and my dad uh, butchered a squirrel earlier, so here's the squirrel meat. And we're going to be having that for dinner tonight, so it's going to be my first, our first time trying squirrel. What's it taste like? 
quite nice. Nice and warm. Is it similar to chicken? Oh, it is actually. A bit of seasoning on it will be gorgeous. That's yeah. quite nice. So the squirrel's good. Really enjoying it. We're now heading so home, hot. had a good time at the Bushcraft Show, haven't we Bex? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>